There we go. Okay, module number 10. Uh, this week we're gonna cover two chapters. Hooray. The first one is all about protecting the endpoints. That thing that the users' is grubby hands are on. As security professionals, you'll be asked to recommend, implement, manage, or assess security solutions intended to protect desktops, mobile devices, servers, and a variety of systems, all referred to as endpoints. You need to know what options exist, where and how they are commonly deployed, and what considerations you need to take into account. The first one is preserving boot integrity. Utilizing the unified extensible firmware interface for all those devices who have it. Within UEFI is the secure boot. This feature ensures the system boots only with software that the original equipment manufacturer trusts. There's also the measured boot, taking the hashes of the firmware, the bootloader, the drivers, and anything else that's part of the boot process against the trusted platform module or TPM to be validated and the administrators know the state of the system. These TPM chips provide hardware root of trust, which is a cryptographic key that ensures the security of the boot process, as well as holding serial numbers that can't be modified or cloned to provide a unique fingerprint of the device. Most modern motherboards now come with a TPM module as part of it. Windows 11 has had a major fiasco over forcing these on systems and making older systems who don't have it uh, not able to update and whatnot. I'm sure you've heard of all that madness in the news. In and of itself, the idea is fine. I mean, all of the Apple devices have a TPM chip. When Microsoft is just trying to, to copy the same thing for all of Windows devices, enforcing them to have some sort of TPM chip on there. Android devices also have TPM chips. So this, this is not a new, co new concept. The problem is not everybody has TPM chip on their home systems or on their work systems because not everybody buys new hardware every year. But the idea is actually a good one of, hey, we have this system, we're going to install this operating system on it, and this operating system alone should be the only one that runs. This will prevent anybody from restarting, sticking a, a Linux uh, live disk and trying to get to the contents of the system. The computer just simply won't boot. It's a good defense. It's just hard to slam that on people as a requirement when not everybody's there. In the business perspective, this could be a piece of cake if all systems were bought the same and they all have this chip within them, then piece of cake implementation. Home users, different story. Some tools at your disposal. Your antivirus or anti-malware is still a useful defensive layer. It is by far one of the most common tools implemented on endpoints where malware could attack or be detected. These tools use a variety of detection methods. There is the signature based, using hashes to identify files and components of malware that have been previously observed. Polymorphism, which is malware changing every time it runs, and encryption makes these signatures less useful. And by the way, signatures are only useful when a piece of malware has been previously detected and categorized. Otherwise, a signature-based antivirus or anti-malware is totally useless. 
but it's not your one-stop shop. More modern antivirus, anti-malware. I'm just going to say anti-malware because it's just the bigger umbrella. Have a, a method of heuristic or behavioral based. They'll look at the actions of applications and match them to profiles of unwanted activities. Which again, if it doesn't have a profile of a certain malware activity, it won't necessarily know. It'll try to guess, but it may not get it right. They also have AI and machine learning, where they'll leverage large amounts of data to find ways to identify malware using the methods above, like heuristic, untrusted, signature, and so on. And there's also sandboxing, isolating applications and running them in a, in a sandbox that is separate from the system so that if it's malicious, it doesn't get out to the system, it only stays within the sandbox. Again, your antivirus, anti-malware type of thing is not your end all be all. It is one toolkit, but you should not put all your reliance on it. There's also the allow and deny lists. These allow or prevent software from being installed, from running, being removed, or just being disabled on systems. This is not seen widespread because can you imagine trying to maintain this list up to date with more applications being created and ran, more things happening on the browser, uh, extensions up the wazoo, Good luck keeping that list up. There is the endpoint detection and response, or EDR. These tool monitoring capability allow search and exploration of the collected data for use by investigators or detect suspicious data. A search for indicators of compromise using automated rules and detection engines. So while your anti-malware is solely focused on anti-malware activity, your EDR solution is looking at compromises by an attacker. The two tools don't do the same job. They're looking at different things but they are working together in the, in the same system. There's also data loss prevention, putting labels or tags on data in order to classify them, having the correct policy management and enforcement functions in order to manage, monitor, and report any malicious use of data from exfiltration to um, copying it to a, a disk. You know, if, if you have your uh, intellectual property, you wanna tag that and so that anytime anybody access it, anybody reads it, writes to it, you have a log of that. There's network defenses. Having host-based firewalls can stop unwanted traffic, but they don't provide much insight to the traffic they are filtering. This is where things like host intrusion prevention systems can analyze the traffic before services or applications on the host process them. They can take action on that traffic, including filtering or blocking. Remember that a intrusion detection system does not take action, but only reports and alerts on issues. One of my favorite tools is Velociraptor. With those tools, those monitoring and whatnot, you still have to do some work yourself, like hardening them, hardening those endpoints, 
changing the settings, that, especially the default settings, to increase the overall level of security and reduce the vulnerability to attack. One of the fastest ways to decrease the attack services of a system is to reduce the number of open ports and services it provides. It's the equivalent of saying, we need to lock down our house, but let's close the doors and lock them. Let's close the windows and lock them. The more windows and doors are closed and locked, the harder it, it is for anything or anyone to get in. Not looking at your system, at your system services is the equivalent of saying, yes, we're going to lock down our, our house, but we're going to leave some doors and windows open. Sometimes it's inevitable to have to have certain ports open, like DNS, for example, or SSH. Having proper logging, having proper alerting systems will help you in identifying when and if an attack is hitting your system. Hardening an operating system relies on changing settings to match your desired security stance. There are a number of places that you can get information. For example, the CIS benchmark, which I have linked in the lecture notes. Some examples that they have are setting password history to remember 24 or more passwords, setting the maximum password age to 60 or fewer days, but not zero, setting the minimum password length to 14 or more characters, disabling the storage of passwords using reversible encryption. Regardless of the operating system, whether Windows, Linux, or Mac, you need to know that operating system hardening uses system settings to reduce the attack surface. Tools and standards exist to help with that process and that assessing, auditing, and maintaining operating system hardening for your organization is part of the overall security management process. Just remember that it is that endpoint that is usually where attacks come from because the attacker successfully tricked a user to click on a link or to download a file. So just as you wanna put your emphasis on your servers and network hardware, you also want to put that same emphasis to the endpoints. Windows, it's soft underbelly is the registry. It's the core of how Windows tracks what is going on. You must uh, have this in your sites. It involves configuring uh, permissions for registry, preventing remote registry access and limiting the access to registry tools. Easiest place is an enterprise where configuration management should follow a process from building a baseline and applying standards to writing documentation that can include diagrams, architecture, network and data flow, et cetera. Naming standards and addressing schemas help simplify management and response to incidents when they occur. Naming standards helps knowing which systems you are managing and ensuring that the expected systems are there. Using standard addressing schemes allow for managing the network resources, preventing collisions, running out of addresses, and so on. Being able to quickly identify what computer is what. So that if you need to go in person, you get the right computer. Patch management removes, no, removes known vulnerabilities. 
timely patching decreases how long exploits and flaws can be used against a system, but of course it comes with its own set of risks. Patches can introduce new flaws or cause new issues. It is always recommended to test the patch before you deploy to minimize the number of issues that may arise. It is always recommended to test before you deploy. The last thing you want is to deploy updates on a Friday night and you plan to do this, that, and the other with friends and family, and then everything stopped working and you got to run back to the office or jump back on your laptop and figure out what happened. Full disk encryption. Encrypts the disk and ensures the bootloader provides a decryption key in order to use the drive. The simplest attack against a system that has full disk encryption is to gain access when the drive is unlocked and therefore the system on. Volume encryption protects specific volumes of the drive, whereas file and folder encryption will protect specific data. Full disk encryption can be implemented with self-encrypting drives. If the encryption key is lost, the data will be unrecoverable. That is actually not a bad thing. Even though it sounds bad, it's not a bad thing. It is better that a disk that, that is a self-encrypting drive uh, be stolen and the decryption key lost than it is for a disk to be stolen with the decryption key. Because if an attacker is able to steal the drive, and doesn't have the decryption key, your data is still safe. Yes, the physical disk is gone, but your data, the thing that we're supposed to be protecting, will still be safe. It'll be inaccessible to that attacker. And now they have a disk that they can do whatever they want, but our data is still safe. Speaking of, any drive that you are no longer going to be using, should be sanitized. You could wipe the data or destroy the drive. Depending on the level of sensitivity will require what method you go with. For example, uh, Deben's boot and nuke can perform multiple writes to a drive to try to drown out the data. Tapes and similar magnetic media can be wiped using a degausser or exposing them to a very strong electromagnetic field to scramble the bits written to the drive. You could also go the more fun way of destroying the drive by shredding, pulverizing, incinerating, melting, however you want to go to prevent the data from ever being recovering by physically destroying the, the drive. I'm a fan of explosives and fire, so I kind of go down that road. File manipulation and accessible command line tools are available to both users and attackers who can extract data. Ensuring data has the proper permissions to prevent unauthorized users from accessing data is of course important. Security Plus expects you to already understand Linux command line tools like head, tail, cat, grep, chmod, logger, among other tools. Security Plus also expects you to already have an understanding on how to use PowerShell and Bash effectively. So if you are unfamiliar with Linux, if you are unfamiliar with the Bash shell or PowerShell, I highly suggest doing things like under the wire and over the wire, uh, Linux Journey and others, because it is a requirement for the Security Plus.
a different type of endpoint system that you have to be aware of is the embedded. These computers are built into other devices like industrial machinery, appliances, cars, and so on. They are highly specialized, running customized operating systems with specific functions and interfaces. They may also have Wi-Fi, cellular, or other networking means. They may run real-time operating systems, which processes data as it comes in rather than using interrupts. They respond quickly to input and have little variance to their input. The three that Security Plus focuses on are the Raspberry Pi, which is a single board computer with computational capabilities and usual computer interfaces, can run a variety of operating systems and can be used for development or a small scale. The Arduino, a microcontroller with a low power CPU with interfaces for sensors or motors. They typically don't have wireless or wired network capabilities. And also a field programmable gate array. Computer chips that can be redesigned uh, they can perform specific tasks and can be a component of an embedded system. Assessing embedded systems is the same as traditional computers, like identifying their manufacturer, their interfaces with the world, the network communications, how to update them, and how to document their findings. Furthering on, are the industrial control systems, which is a broad term for industrial automation, and the supervisory control and data acquisition, or SCADA, referring to large systems that run power and water distribution, or other systems that cover large areas. SCADA copies data acquisition and control devices, computers, communication capabilities, and an interface to control and monitor the architecture. We usually find these in complex manufacturing and industrial processes where monitoring, adjusting, controlling the entire process is critical to success. These two can be used to control and manage facilities like HVAC systems. These systems provide a complex issue for security professionals to solve since most are designed without security in mind. Whatever solution you come up with cannot interfere with the function of the system, especially those that use real-time operating systems. Yet another endpoint device, the Internet of Things, a broad term for network-connected device used for automation, sensors, security, and similar tasks. IoT brings issues such as poor security practices like weak default settings, the lack of network security, exposed and vulnerable services, the lack of encryption, weak authentication, embedded credentials, insecure data storage, along with short lifespans and vendor data handling practice issues. They're everywhere and you can't ignore them, but they are a pain. We also have specialized systems like medical systems, which may be networked or may have embedded systems like pacemakers or insulin pumps and also have Bluetooth capabilities. We have smart meters that track utility usage via wireless, providing an attack surface that in interfere with water and power. We have vehicles, drones, and autonomous vehicles. Now, all these different, uh, different vehicles that are network connected could all be vulnerable to attacks that could take control, monitor, or seriously impact them. We have VoIP systems. These voice over IP phones have interfaces for direct remote login or management. 
Let's not forget printers who have networking built in and have poor security models. Multifunction printers store information from faxes, printouts, and copies, and can be a source of data leakage, can be pivot points, reflectors, or amplifiers in an attack. And surveillance systems. Cameras can be internet connected and used by attackers to see what the victim sees or change the view of the victim because they don't have strong encryption, because their settings are easily manipulative. A lot of these suckers use things like cellular and Zigbee to communicate. More things to be aware of. For cellular, uh, ensuring that devices don't expose vulnerable services or applications to their cell connections will help prevent exploits from traversing internal security boundaries. Physically securing the SIM card to prevent it from being removed or repurposed or cloned is another threat. The last thing you want is to connect an IoT device to your network for whatever reason, and it has a cellular connection and an attacker gets into your network through that cellular connection. Or the other way around, uh, it leaking information through that way when you have all your defenses set up at your router. Zigbee is a low power peer-to-peer -peer communication that doesn't have strong security models, but is used for home automation and similar uses. It having uh, weak security models means that Zigbee can be used to wreak havoc. So as I've kind of alluded, but now we'll uh, mention the security constraints of all embedded systems. Keep in consideration the computational power and capacity. The system, like say a internet facing a camera may not have the means to do cryptographic processes or have a firewall or have anti-malware in order to do its intended job. It's just a camera that's connected to the internet and has no security. These embedded systems may not connect to a network. It may not have the capability or the component like a network card in order to do so. This does mean, wow, that sounds like a good idea. The bad part of it is patching, monitoring, or maintenance is now that much more difficult. With no network connectivity, CPU or memory, there really is no way to authenticate or it's not desirable due to a safety or usability factor. And lastly, embedded systems have a high cost to change. As pieces, as a piece of a larger industrial or specialized device, a change could have a ripple effect that makes replacing a vulnerable device virtually impossible. All these things to consider when we think about protecting our endpoint devices. Any questions so far? Cool. And we'll move on to chapter 12. This one is about designing secure networks. As security professionals, you must understand and be able to implement design 
and architectures found in networks and properly secure them. You need to know what tools and systems are deployed, why they're deployed, and how they can be deployed as part of a layered security design. The concept of defense and depth applies. Multiple controls ensure that a failure in a single or multiple control is unlikely to cause a security breach. Being able to conceptually describe the network and the various answers to secure those layers is expected. So you should be able to recite the seven layers of the OSI model and also what can be done at those different levels to secure them. Something like this. Network segmentation. Networks can be divided into logical or physical groupings based on trust boundaries, functional requirements, or other reasons to apply controls or assist with functionality. We have things like VLANs that segment at the data link layer. We have DMZs demilitarized zones that contain systems that are exposed to less trusted areas like the internet. We have intranets, internal networks that are protected from external access and extranets, networks set up for external access by partners or customers. There is also the zero trust where nobody is trusted. Port spanning and port mirroring can send a copy of all traffic from one port to another. Network access control determines whether a system should be allowed to connect to a network, check its patch levels, security settings, antivirus versions, and so on. Port security and port level protections limit the number of MAC addresses that can be used on a single port, preventing any MAC address spoofing, content addressable memory, cable overflows, and plugging network devices to extend the network. Now, mind you, uh, spoofing MAC addresses is a relatively easy process, and you should really not use it. At least don't. Don't depend on it. Within this realm, we still have things like loop prevention, preventing spanning tree protocol from creating loops when multiple network switches are interconnected, when firewalls are plugged in backwards or other misconfigurations, preventing broadcast storms as they traverse a network, having bridge protocol data unit protects spanning tree protocol by preventing ports that should not send these BDPU messages from sending. And also having things like dynamic host configuration protocol snooping to prevent any rogue DHCP, DHCP servers from handing out IP addresses to clients in a managed network. The other way to segment networks is with VPNs linking endpoints together to act as though they are on the same network. Not necessarily a requirement for them to be encrypted, but you can with IPsec, which works at layer three, requiring a client to operate in tunnel where the entire packet is sent to the other end are protected. The other way that an IPsec tunnel works is with transport mode where the IP header is not protected, but the payload is. IPsec is normally used for site-to-site -site VPNs and any need to transport more than just web app 
web or application traffic. SSL VPNs, which actually are using TLS, are used as a portal-based approach with HTML5, where a user is accessing via a web page and then can access services through that connection. These are clientless on the endpoint and allow segmentation using different hosts or different names. Some network appliance security tools can be things like jump servers or jump boxes. They're secured and monitored systems used to provide access into security zones with different security levels. They'll have RDP or SSH and should be configured to create and maintain a secure audit trail with tools required for administrative work. Jump boxes are great if you can set them up with HTML so that a user just goes to a site, connects to a box, and from there they can access the network. Load balancers distribute traffic to multiple systems, provide redundancy, and allow for ease of upgrades and patching. The two main types are the active-active and active-passive. Active-active will distribute loads among multiple systems that are online and in use at the same time, whereas active-passive will bring backup or secondary systems on when an active system is removed or fails to respond. Active-passive is great for disaster recovery. They also have four main scheduling algorithms like the round robin, where each request is sent to servers by working through a list, and each server in turn receives that traffic. The least connection, traffic to the server with the least amount of active connections will get a new connection. Agent-based, adaptive, which monitors load and other factors that impact the server's response time, updating the traffic distribution as necessary and source IP hashing, where uh, the source IP is hashed and assigned to a server. It's more random. Four other load balancer considerations are the weighted last, which is least connection algorithm combined with the predetermined weight for each server, the fixed weight, where every Server has a pre-assigned weight based on their capability or their capacity. The weighted response combines server response times with weight values to give it traffic. And persistence, client and server communicate uh, throughout the session for a smoother experience with consistent information maintained about the client. We also have the proxies. These accept and forward requests, centralizing the request and allowing actions to be taken on the request and responses. They can also filter and modify traffic and cache data and be used to support access restrictions by IP addresses or any similar requirement. The two main types of proxies are the forward and reverse. The forward are placed between clients and servers. They can seal the original content and can anonymize traffic or even provide access to resources that might be blocked by an IP address or a geographical location. The reverse are placed between servers and clients, used for load balancing and caching content. Clients can query a single system but have traffic load spread to multiple systems or multiple sites. So once again, a forward proxy is from the client out to the server. A reverse proxy is on the server. Clients hit a reverse proxy. Network address translation gateways allow many private IPv4 addresses to use a single public IP address to access the internet. 
NAT gateways provide function and track which packet should be sent to what device. You will see these in homes and cloud infrastructure as a service environment where private addresses are used for internal networking. We also have the content or URL filters that allow or block traffic based on rules. They can block URLs, domains, or hosts uh, with pattern matching, IP reputation, and so on. They can have allowed denial lists. Proxies have content filtering. And other networking devices can have similar capabilities like firewalls, network security appliances, intrusion prevention systems, and so on. Data loss, like I mentioned in the last chapter, pairing agents with filtering capabilities on the network border, on email servers, and any way that data, especially sensitive data, could get accidentally or intentionally leaked. This will prevent our sensitive data from getting out to the world and notify admins. Intrusion detection and prevention systems will detect threats and block them. You have the signature, heuristic, and anomaly based. You remember that your intrusion detection will only detect and alert you. The prevention systems will do the first two things and actively block. If you've never played with Waza, I highly suggest playing with that, implementing that on your home network. It's a pretty awesome tool. Let's also not forget firewalls. Our stateless firewalls who, pack it, who filter packets and our, uh, yeah, that's stateless and stateful, which have dynamic packet filtering. So your stateless firewall is your most basic type of firewall. They'll filter packets based on provided data like the source of destination IP and port. Stateful will make decision based on the conversation and the information gathered from traffic flow to provide a greater context. Get it, get it, firewall. There's also the unified threat management. UTN devices are firewalls, IPSs, IDSs, anti-malware, all of those guys put together. These appliances are frequently deployed at network boundaries, sometimes replacing several security devices while providing a single interface to manage and monitor. The problem with these guys is it's a single thing. So a single point of failure, if it gets compromised or it goes down, so does everything else. Your network security, your services and management. Well, the first one is out of band management. Out of band just means a separate means of accessing an interface should option A go down. So we have our router that is usually accessible through a wired internet connection. If for some reason that goes down and we still need access to it, well, then we could use something like a cellular connection to be able to get to the same device. There's the good old access control lists that can help filter out data and say what can and can't get through. This quality of service, the IEEE 802.1Q and 11E define how traffic can be tagged and prioritized. QoS offers support for bandwidth and traffic management queuing that can be used to ensure important traffic flows, or an improperly configured QoS can be a threat to a network.
There's route security. Attacks against routing protocols can result in man-in-the-middle attacks, outages, delays, or drop in traffic. Case in point, Facebook, not that long ago, did a BGP update and knocked the <laughs> knocked themselves out. And that wasn't even an attack. That was just a misconfiguration. Nonetheless, that is a threat that you need to be aware of if your network uses BGP. So also should be familiar with the open shortest path first, OSPF and EIGRP, the Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol, which is a Cisco proprietary. Now you don't have to be an expert in these three. You don't have to be able to know exactly what commands to configure them and whatnot. You just have to have an understanding of the protocol, how it works, how routers talk to each other, and how madness like Facebook doesn't happen on your network. But you don't need to be uh, a CCNA level to be able to pass a security plus. DNS is not a secure protocol, yet it is critical to our networks. So having things like domain name system security extensions or DNSSEC, will provide authentication of DNS data. Having DNS sinkholes, a DNS server configured to provide incorrect answers to specific queries to cause malicious or unwanted domains to resolve to a harmless address and allow logging to identify infected or compromised systems is definitely useful. This is great to set up on your enterprise network. So when, a compromised system tries to get into a, a known domain of attackers, you, you find out. Using things like TLS instead of SSL, because SSL has been outdated moving on to uh, newer, more modern communications, having the correct monitoring software to help you validate when a service report is open using the correct metrics, having file integrity monitoring, creating fingerprints for your files and monitoring those changes. And having some form of deception and disruption like honeypots intentionally configured to appear vulnerable, but are heavily instrumented to collect information about attacks. There's also honey nets that do the same, net, same thing as a network and honey files that have unique detectable data that is left for an attacker. So if you see certain information discovered outside your network, you know you've been breached. All these ways can help to provide network security and management. Also helps to use secure protocols. Things that you need to, to ask though, you can't just say, okay, we're gonna use all secure protocols right now. You also have to think about um, how you're gonna make the switch, what protocols might coexist, and additional factors like the, the endpoints that are on the network or services that, that are on the network that may require insecure protocols. How do, you, how, do, how do you go around all those things? You don't just say, we're gonna do these because they're secure and we're done. You want to think about what you're doing before you before you implement them. So some attacks on networks are things like man in the middle, where an attacker causes 
traffic that should be sent to an intended recipient to be relayed on a device they control. This can be done with SSL stripping, removing that encryption in order to read the traffic. You can prevent this with the HTTP strict transport security. You can prevent uh, cookie jacking as well. There's also man in the browser, a Trojan inserting itself into a browser and just bypassing any encryption. There's DNS attacks they need to be aware of, like DNS hijacking, DNS poisoning, and redirection. But DNS hijacking is changing the registration of a domain through a vulnerability with the domain registrar, with social engineering, a legitimate owner not renewing the domain. DNS poisoning is caused by a man in the middle attack where an attacker provides a DNS response pretending to be an authoritative DNS server that will stick into the DNS cache and stay there until it's purged or updated. So this can have a long-term effect. And URL redirection can be as simple as inserting an alternate IP address in a system host file. Down at layer two, you have attacks like ARP poisoning against the address resolution protocol, MAC flooding, flooding the, uh, the MAC table. So the switch becomes a hub and then being able to listen to all the packets that are coming in on that area. Doing distributed denial of service, which are large scale botnet attacks that are usually volume-based and can be either a UDP flood or a ping flood. You have other, other protocol-based attacks like uh, SYN packets. Uh, older denial of service attacks have the ping of death, where a ping packet is just too large for the device to handle. Or fragmented packets. Uh, or packets that have all their flags on. All fun attacks that you need to be aware of that show up on the test. You should be familiar with the following command line tools in any operating system. You should know how to use them. These show up on that exam. Along with a basic understanding of Nmap, a very popular port scanning tool. Nessus, a vulnerability scanning tool. Uh, OpenVAS, which is an open source alternative to Nessus. Uh, some open source, or actually some data transfer tools like Netcat, uh, curl, HPing. Open source intelligence tools like the Harvester, Scanless, Sniper, and DNS Enum. And some packet capture and replay tools like Wireshark, TCP Dump, T Shark, uh, Scapy, and even the, the Cuckoo Sandbox. This list of tools that I kind of ran quickly through all show up on the test in one way or another. So again, having a basic understanding of how to use Nmap, how to use Nessus, uh, Netcat, Curl, The Harvester, Wireshark, Scapy, Ping, and it's look of all these things show up on that test. Because as I've said before, Security Plus isn't a cyber hygiene thing.
with Security Plus, you should have a basic understanding of how technology works, how to use these various tools, and use them in a way to defend. So with all that said, are there any questions on this chapter? Okay, seeing no questions. If you do come up with any, always use Discord. The lab this week is back to try Hackney and completing four rooms that relate to the tools or the topics mentioned in the lecture. So I, mean, I know there's a Nessus room. I know there's an MNAP room. There's two of the four that you could knock out. Find rooms that relate to the topics covered in either chapter. And you could even pick some from the, from the previous chapter and then this chapter, however you want. But get your hands on in, knock out four rooms and submit those as proof. That is the work for this week.